Today, I want to share with you about Chapter 33 Leadership. Leadership by being an example of life. Jesus is the model of new creation, the born-again Christians. He is the example. He is the true teacher. He is the example of serving others. We only have to follow Jesus watching him. How he trained his disciples, how he preached the gospel, how he did miracles, and how he showed his life and real himself to his disciples are our examples. All we have to do is to follow him watching his steps. He is our true mentor and teacher. He came down to this land to serve. He has given us an example as a servant. So, we should do as Jesus had done to others in this land as a servant. We can learn his leadership in this world through four Gospels. First, the Bible tells us that the student is not above the teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is also the same in terms of hardships and persecutions. It means, the students are not persecuted more than the teachers. Then who suffers more? The teachers are more persecuted than the students. Will we suffer more than Jesus? No, we won't. Jesus is our teacher. And the Bible says, the student is not above the teacher. The Lord had suffered more than us. It is enough for students to be like their teachers and servants like their masters. We learn humility from this. Let's read Matthew 10 verses 24 to 25. The student is not above the teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for students to be like their teachers and servants like their masters. What we learn from this is humility. I will explain about it later on. Second, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. Matthew 20 verse 28 Humility The Lord told me that, love releases the hardness of a person's mind. It is love that melts everyone's heart. And meek. Meek means laying down everything. Humility also means letting down oneself. Jesus also explained that the man who serves in this land is the biggest one in heaven. The words meek and humility are the same meaning. Meek is like flour. The wheat is very rough. If you grind the wheat in a grinder, it becomes soft flour. Isn't it very soft when you touch flour? Yes, it is. The flour is very smooth. If so, how many times and processes did the wheat grind to be flour? It would have been so painful to break itself from the point of view of wheat. Until everyone felt soft to touch, the wheat went through a situation and process of breaking and crushing. But at the end, it became so soft that no one could think of the wheat as the rough wheat of the past. That is true. It is beneficial to others. Like this, humility and meek are the same thing. People with those are the ones who have ground themselves to lay down themselves, who have denied themselves, who have broken themselves, who are humbled and who are meek. The people who are meek and humble are the ones who ground themselves to lay down themselves and have denied themselves. In the Bible, it is written that Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. A person who had no thoughts of his own and obedience to the commands of the Lord. If the Lord says, go there, and you replied, no, I don't want to go there, then it means you have your own thoughts. But the person who answers, yes, I will go and do as you wish, when the Lord commands, is a humble person. These kind of people are the people who are meek and have no their own thoughts. The Lord said that they are the real servants. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus is a servant. He came to serve, not to be served. He came to this land as a servant. How thankful! It is so different from the pastors and us in these days. We like and are delighted to be served. However, Jesus came to serve as a servant. As a servant, he came to this land to serve us, the creations. He is the true example of us. Third, 
whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. A servant is a person who serves. He stands by and serves the master when he eats. Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. The greatest among you will be your servant. It is very different from the world systems. This is from Matthew 23 verse 11. Then, what is the way of the world? What is the king like? He is served, right? He rules, oppresses others and is to be served from those people. But we Christians are rulers of all these creatures. How about us, even though we Christians are the rulers of all creatures? We serve. The way of governing of the Lord is to serve. It is indeed contrary to the way of the world. What do the kings of this world do? They reign. They reign over the people by oppressing them. However, his reign, which God asked us to rule, is the governing of service. It's a leadership by being an example of life, isn't it? It is greatly different from the world's systems. When Christians have a position in the world as leaders, or when they are in charge of something in the church, they should always help people as a servant. For example, if you were promoted to manager or section chief at your company, then you should serve your colleagues more than before. If so, they will do their best to you as well. They will think that you, the manager, are the good example for them. A person who has the mind of a servant picks up the trash on the floor when he or she sees it. And you put it in the trash can. But the employees of the company leave it on the floor. That is the difference between an employee and a boss, and between an employee and a servant. When people need something and if you go and fill their needs, then you are a person who serves. If the manager did like this, the staffs there would feel sorry for him. Yet, they have a deep respect in their minds. Do we get respect from someone if we say, now you respect me because I am the manager of the department? No. You should serve them first. While they need something such as a cup of tea, make a cup of tea and give it to them. If a manager makes some tea or coffee to the colleagues, then the colleagues will be sorry to the manager. The manager will be a good example, right? That's why the Bible says that he who serves is the biggest person in heaven. And actually, he will be an example in this world. He cannot but be a person who is held in respect. Fourth, for those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. If you do love the Lord and obey him with pleasure and willing, he will exalt you. If the Lord exalts you, you will be exalted. If so, humble yourselves. Lower yourselves and exalt the Lord only. Then the Lord shall promote you more. The more he exalts you, the lower you become and say, only Jesus will be the highest. If you do so, you will never be arrogant. The Lord will continue to exalt you. Then you can keep going. Why does the problem happen? Though you are humble, if the Lord exalts you, you will be higher. At that time, you must not think that you would take a high place just like the Lord because He exalts you. When the Lord goes up high, I have to go down further. Even if the Lord raises you up, you should be humble and continue to serve Him more humbly, then the Lord will steadily exalt you. This is the nature of God. People who lower themselves would be higher. Those who are humble and meek, abandon themselves and give up their thoughts and feelings of the flesh, are the one who lower themselves. Those who are humble, kind and able to deny oneself will live by the lead of the Holy Spirit rather than the flesh. Such a person is truly a great man. I have discussed about humility and haughtiness from the former lesson. I said that the truly humble man abandons his thoughts and follows the Bible. If a man's idea is a but the idea of the Bible is b, so he abandons his idea a and follows the idea of the Bible, then he is a truly humble man. A haughty man goes his way and abandons the Bible when his thoughts are a but the Bible is b. A person who follows his thoughts is so arrogant. He does according to the carnal mind. Like this, Jesus played the roles. The leadership of Jesus was the leadership of a servant. 
Yes, that is true. Jesus lived a life on this land as a sincere servant. All we need is to learn from Jesus. All of you try to study the biblical figures. It would be instructive for you. Let us take a look at Matthew 20 verse 28 to understand what kind of leadership Jesus had. Matthew 20 verse 28 Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. Amen. The Son of Man, Jesus, did not come to be served, but to serve. Jesus healed the sick. Did he heal with charge? No, he did not. He healed the sick for free of charge. Additionally, Jesus taught people. In the day and night, he taught them. Moreover, Jesus also preached the gospel. There was not even enough time for him to eat during his ministry. He healed the sick all day because he wanted them to be healed. He didn't have enough time to eat to heal the sick, and sometimes, he stayed up all night and healed them. He really worked hard. He was a perfect servant. Let's think about the intercessors. They can rest. They also can sleep peacefully at night. However, why do they wake up at night and pray for the souls and churches of the whole world? Because they have the heart of the Lord who takes pity on those souls. This is serving. The Lord told me once that there is a function called a heart in our body. We all have hearts. Other parts of our body can take a rest. However, the heart cannot stop working. The heart must continue to supply blood, filter it out, and beat without stopping. Other parts of the body can rest, but the heart keeps beating. It does those roles such as beating and supplying blood. There are many parts in our body, but the heart is special. Like this, Jesus came to this land to serve. He could rest. Nevertheless, he constantly healed the sick to make them better. He preached them the gospel so that they could come to heaven. He taught them the word of God so that they could live in obedience to God's will. He did that for us to live like Jesus and to make us be rewarded. He came to serve, which is very different from the behaviors of big church pastors and ministers. He showed his leadership to his disciples by living together. How about us? Church pastors and ministers. Big churches are even worse. How well are they treated by the saints? They are treated as much as the Lord deserves. Our Lord could not be treated like that when he was in this land. Yet, pastors in these days are served like that. Members of the church buy lots of things to them and exalt them up, don't they? Pastors do serve the saints with preaching the word of God. And they have to serve people with prayer. Who should pray the most in the church? Pastor. Pastors have to pray the most. Should the intercession prayers pray the most? Some pastors say like this, I only need to be good at sermon. And the prayer can be done by the intercession prayers. It's wrong. They have been completely mistaken. God anointed the pastors in order to take care of his sheep. So what do they use to take care of the flock? We naturally meet, encourage, comfort others. But, look at the life of Jesus. Jesus taught the word of God during the day, and in the evening he prayed before God for his flock. Father, help them that their faith may not fail. God, help them stand firm in faith and go all the way through the narrow path of faith. He also prayed to protect them from evil. And he prayed that they could obey everything he had commanded. He prayed for them to go all the way to the end of their calling. By the prayer of Jesus, they were able to throw all the stones and bad things they had and run to God without going into the world. He always prayed before God Father. We, pastors should always pray for the flock by calling out the names of the flock one by one. We must pray for them to stick to the faith in God, not to fall down, and stand unshaken on the faith, the faith in God and trust in God. We must pray every day for the flock to be protected from evil and pray that they may follow all the words God has commanded us to obey. 
so that they can go all the way through the narrow path of faith. We have to pray to pull out all the stones or weeds from the flock. Until they grow up, Jesus anointed the pastors as a shepherd to do this sort of things. Therefore, the pastors have to pray laboriously. They need to pray for the flock of sheep. Who are the intercession prayers? The pastors are the intercession prayers. What does a pastor do? He or she has to be devoted to prayer and preaching the word. Those are really important. That is how pastors serve the flock. It is to serve with prayer. Jesus prayed for the sheep as a leader through the leadership of a servant. That is why the disciples grew up beautifully. We all need to see that. We are servants. A person who serves is a servant. Why should a servant live so well? Should a servant live in luxury? Of course the Lord has told us to enjoy it. However, pastors must be mature in spiritually, right? If so, shouldn't they take a narrow path of faith by themselves? Is it right for a shepherd to fill his stomach only while the flock of sheep live in poverty and have difficulties in living? The shepherd has to take care of the sheep. The shepherd should not fill his needs only while the sheep are starving. The shepherd must think I should endure the difficulties with my flock. This is the attitude of the shepherds who know the heart of Jesus. Of course, we have to teach them how to be rich and healthy through the scripture so that they can live by holding it. Not only that, but just because everything is right for us does not mean everything is good for them. We have to be an example of faith. We have to be a model of servant and lower ourselves to serve them. So if the pastors live like them, they will truly respect their pastors more. They will think, our pastor is a true example of Jesus. He is a model of a servant. We, pastors cannot ask them to respect us because we are the pastors. But if we lower ourselves and try to be a good example of a servant just like Jesus, they will respect us. Jesus showed his leadership to his disciples by living together. Such as, prayers, healing, relationship with people, forgiving, discerning people's mind, showing mercy, loving people, performing power, casting our devils, catching fish, way to handle when persecuted, faith, meekness, wisdom, knowledge, way of discipleship, way to serve. Our Lord showed everything to his disciples by living together for three and a half years. And he also showed them having fellowship with Father at dawn while the disciples were sleeping. He showed all the way to feed his disciples first and he even showed them how to pay taxes. He said, go to the sea and throw in a hook and take the first fish that comes up and when you open its mouth, you will find a shekel. Take that and give it to them for you and me. Even though he was an own son of the king, he paid the taxes not to offend the people. The Lord is our exemplary. When Jesus tried to go into a Samaritan village, but the people there did not welcome him, his disciple John asked, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? But Jesus turned and rebuked him, You do not know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. Our Lord loved the people so much. He had mercy on those people and persevered. When you see how long the Lord has been waiting for us patiently, you will realize how perseveringly he waited. He even waited for a person like me, how much better would he wait for you? The Lord is a true example of us. Students must obey teachers, but if the teacher keeps skewing away from the Bible, one should not obey the teacher. If the teacher keeps asking for something different from the Bible, make sure to talk to your teacher. Talk to the mentor what you think of. Talk to your teacher and let him realize. If a teacher teaches something different from the Bible, he must correct himself. That is the only way to be a true teacher and a true mentor. Our genuine leader is Jesus Christ. The Lord will judge us based on the Bible at the last day. The word of the teacher is not truth. The Bible is truth. Brothers and sisters, this is what Jesus told me. Do not pursue, guide, 
or depend on people. Jesus is our guide. Jesus is the way and the truth. He is the way. He is the guide of our way and leads us. Our guide is Jesus, not a human. When you are spiritually immature, you follow people as teachers, but when you grow up a little bit, you will be disappointed with people. So only our teacher is Jesus Christ. He is invisible, but he is in the Bible, isn't he? And he answers when we pray. He commands everything because he is alive. He orders through the Bible, through vision, through dreams, through spiritual voices and through our thoughts. Jesus is our true leader and mentor. Rely on God for everything. Thankfully I learned to rely on the Lord early. I think I have grown up faster because I kept looking for the Lord and relying on Him. I did in the method of God, not of man. I ways asked Him. If the words of a man is different from the words of the Lord, I abandon the words of the man. And I follow the words of the Lord. I only rely on the Bible. As a result, I sometimes get bad names from people. I sometimes get uncomfortable with people. They say, how can you do that? But sometimes the Lord asked me to do that. If the Lord asks you to get out of some group and say, come out from the group. Even though you say, Lord, I don't want to. But you have to come out at the end. About the last month of 2013, I got to work together in a group called Christ Embassy in Nigeria. I was in the Chinese team in that organization and I was a representative of the team. I did the ministry connected with the church in Korea. The organization was very big. And I liked the pastor and the pastor's wife of the Korean church. They were very nice and loved us so much, so we appreciated very much. They loved the Lord, and they were also simple-minded people. So I liked them much. But, while doing the ministry, we had some difficulties. One day while I was praying, the Lord told me to come out of the organization. He told me, for whom do you plant the church? Because it was easy for us to plant a church at that time. I planted 16 churches that year. It was very amusing to plant churches everywhere and to train leaders. I never had an idea, which was it is hard to plant a church. Because I was full of the idea, everything is possible for one who believes. So we prepared to plant more churches with bigger goals for the following year. And the Lord told me this. Do you plant churches for the pastor in Nigeria's headquarters? Or do you plant churches for the pastor in Korea in order to gain favor? He asked me two questions. I was very scared to hear that. So I started to think of it seriously. In fact, I had in my mind that I wanted to gain favor with the pastor and his wife. Because they were very nice. They tried to work diligently for the kingdom of the Lord. So I started checking myself and I realized that the ministry had already been idolized to me. But, by then, the Lord told me to come out of the organization. So I told him, Lord, all right, I will come out at the headquarters in Nigeria. But, I will not get out of the church in Korea that dispatched us. I love them, I love the church, they are good people. Besides, you made me meet them, didn't you? That is why we went in the group. And they also accepted us. And we were working together very well for years. Why are you asking me to come out? I told him like that and he replied, come out. I did make you to join the group. But now I'm telling you to come out, so you have to come out. He told me it was time to come out. So I answered like this, oh no, Lord. This makes the relationship so difficult and you know I like them very much. I am so glad to work with them. But the Lord kept asking me to come out. At that time I was running a Bible school online in China. If I come out from the group then I didn't know what to do with the students were studying in the Bible school. Besides, I made up everything of the online Bible school by working hard, checking proofreading, and translating. 
and if I quit this Bible school, I didn't know who to hand it over to. Furthermore, I will not be able to publish the Bible study books that I was teaching. The damage was too big. And I had no idea what to do. Therefore, I asked him, Lord, can't I postpone leaving the group? Lord, I have no idea with this. If I get out of the organization right now, I won't be able to receive the expenses of my ministry. I will no longer have financial support from them. However, he told me not to receive that money either. And he kept telling me to get out of the group and the church who dispatched me. The Lord's demands were excessive. But, I did as the Lord said. So I told about it to the church in Korea. And the church in Korea was surprised to hear such news. Sometimes, it is really hard to follow the order of the Lord. The Lord's orders are not to be put back and carried out slowly. When we are spiritually mature, the Lord does not lead us like this way. The way the Lord leads us varies from person to person and it depends on the spiritual level. But then, the Lord told me, Do you really fear me? I replied, Yes. What was worse, I asked like this, Lord, are you real? Lord, are you sure that is you? Is that you God? Whereat, the Lord told me to open the book of Genesis chapter 22. He told me Abraham did not doubt at all. When the Lord told Abraham to go and sacrifice Isaac as a burnt offering, he did not doubt about God. Since he asked me to sacrifice many things, I kept on asking him in confusion whether he is the real Lord. After hearing so many times that he was the Lord, I answered, I see. All right, I will do as you said. And I indeed proceeded just as he said. Actually, I did not want to come out of the organization. I did not want to come out from the church in Korea. Because the pastor and his wife were so nice to me that it was really hard for me to break up our relationship like this way. However, the Lord told me to read Proverbs 16 verse 7. When a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord and a man obeys the voice of the Lord, he makes even his enemies live at peace with him. So I told him like this, O oh Lord, I was not an enemy with them. But now, I become an enemy with them because of you, Lord. It's a situation that the relationship suddenly becomes difficult because of the Lord. But, the Lord demands it. And I trusted the Lord and did as he said. When we follow the Lord, we face difficulties. Eventually, we were expelled from China while on a ministry tour. And afterwards, the church in Korea came out of the organization. And God restored our relationship with the pastor and his wife in a year. I was very grateful. They are really nice people. It's the grace of the Lord. I can only say that it is the grace of the Lord. During that time, I learned a lot. As we came out of the organization, we learned how to trust the Lord fully. He filled our needs and gave us more money than we received from the Korean church. And he made us do lots of works including the ministry tour in China. I thank and praise the Lord. God has done all the works. He did everything so that we could rely on the Lord completely. As we obeyed his words, the vessels of our hearts grew wider and wider. I kept working in the position of a servant. When I was spiritually immature, there were times for fasting. I did not have to set the table for my family while fasting. Since I cooked and prepared food for them, they ate personally, and I prayed quietly all alone for a day while fasting. However, it was different when I was continuing 40 days fasting in Korea. At that time, I lived with my son in Mokpo, and my husband stayed in Seoul. About 10 days after I started fasting, the Lord said, Tell your husband to come to Mokpo. He said, Tell your husband to come. Stay with him and cook for him. So I responded, Lord, I am fasting. I am fasting because we ordered me to do. He told me that I have to prepare meals for my husband. I was shocked. He said, when you were spiritually young, I did not ask you to serve your family while fasting. 
However, you want to mature spiritually, don't you? A person who is spiritually mature is the one who serves. Lord wanted me to cook and prepare meals for my husband who was not fasting. He wanted me to serve. So I cooked and set the table for my husband for 40 days during fasting. And my husband was so sorry for me. He only had one meal a day. And he only had light meals such as fruits and vegetables. Because he felt sorry for me since I was fasting. But I said, Honey, you have to eat because it was a command from the Lord. Then I cooked for him. And I was really happy. The happiness of serving my husband while fasting was like the happiness of seeing a person who accepted Jesus and became a Christian after I preached the gospel. The Holy Spirit gave me the joyful mind. I could not be much happier than that. I felt I was full while cooking. I was really happy. Therefore, the more mature we are and the more spiritual we become. The Lord won't leave us alone though we are fasting. He will ask us to serve others as well. He will ask us to preach and other things as well. What He demands for mature Christians is different from what He demands for immature Christians. What does He ask for more to those who are spiritually mature? To serve. This is what Jesus did. We need to rely on the Bible and the Holy Spirit. We can reside in the truth if we follow His words as Jesus is the truth. Our true mentor is the Lord. What would Jesus do in this situation? I always ask this question to myself. I used to go around China and have Christian meetings. And I always brought personal Bible study books. And sometimes I brought some other books as well and gave them to people. But the Lord said, just take the Bible with you. So I took only the Bible. As a result, some churches that couldn't accept about the gifts of the Holy Spirit before have come to accept my messages easily. I cannot express how grateful I was. If you obey the commands of God, He will take care of the rest. It is because the Lord is our teacher. Whether we are teacher or student, we are disciples of Jesus. Do not forget Jesus is our Lord and Teacher. One can become a true teacher when he leads by example through his life by living together with disciples. It is very different to meet once or twice a week and to live together in one house. When the children appreciate and respect their parents, the parents will live a beautiful life indeed. Likewise, if the teacher and student live together and the student respect the teacher, it means that the life of the teacher is beautiful. The life of Jesus was beautiful. When we live with others, we can easily see other people's flaws. Even so, if there is a person who always serves as a servant, everyone will like him or her. If someone serves for me, I would like that person. Do you want to be loved by others? If so, you should serve others gladly. Be their servant. Fill their needs. If they want to drink water, bring them water. That is what a servant does, isn't it? A true teacher. He is the one who embraces the people of the world through the eyes, heart and thought of the Lord. Through whose eyes? Through the eyes of the Lord. In the eyes of the Lord, to forgive the people of the world, forgive the Christians, love them, understand them and embrace them. We cannot embrace them with our own eyes and our minds. With the eyes and mind of a man, with the eyes and heart of the sinful nature, we can't embrace them. That is why you should embrace them with the Lord's eyes and heart. That is what the Lord tells us. It is because we cannot understand them with our own thoughts. Having mercy on them is the mind of the Lord. Jesus Christ paid the price for them that they belong to the Lord. They are the children of God. Therefore, the Lord does not want them to go to the hell, because they belong to Him. The Lord stated in Ezekiel 33 verse 11, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Romans 5 verse 10 says, When we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to Him through the death of His Son. When we truly understand the hearts of the Lord, we can truly embrace people. If we do not understand the hearts of the Lord, how can we embrace people? 
we will be able to embrace people only after we understand the hearts of the Lord. Think of those people you don't understand as your children, as your son and your daughter. Think of those people who has been cursing you or never listened to you as your children. If you are a shepherd of the church and there is a sheep from the flock who is disobedient, try to think of a person as your son or daughter. Then what would you do to him or her? You will be willing to love, forgive and understand. This is the mind of a parent. We were like them in the in the past. While we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, Jesus Christ, who gave us life. One day, a sister said to me, my husband doesn't listen to me. I'm really upset. So I told her, what if your husband were a flock of sheep in your cell group? What would you do if your husband is a member and you are the leader of the group? She couldn't say anything. If he comes home at 10 o'clock and asks you to have some food because he is hungry, will you just drive him out even though he is the member of your cell group? She answered, no. She said she would welcome the sheep with the heart of a shepherd. So I told her, right. Always think of your husband as a member of your cell group. She answered, oh, I think it will be very different. Just thinking they're the flock of sheep makes us change our attitude. What if we think they are our sons and daughters? You would accept everything. We must meditate deeply about Jesus Christ. We must sincerely think about him who loved us so much and gave us his only life when we were enemies of God. You should always think, what would Jesus do if he were me? How would Jesus treat my husband? How would Jesus treat those people if he were in my shoes? There would be an answer. Jesus would embrace them and understand them. That is the answer. Then we will be able to embrace them with the minds of Jesus. The Lord told me, widen your heart. I know you always ask for more anointment. And I do as you want. However, if the heart of your bowl is this big, you only get as much anointment as the size of your bowl. And the rest of it overflows. You have to make your bowl bigger. Open your heart and enlarge your mind. Solomon had a mind as wide as the sea. The heart of our Lord is wider than the sea. We have to act in accordance with the Scripture and the Holy Spirit. And we should enlarge our mind. People with these qualities are true leaders. A man with no thoughts of his own. If we don't have our own minds, then what else is left? The mind of Jesus. If my thoughts were 30% in this cup, the other 70% would be Jesus. That is what I look like. Even though the Lord dwells in me, but my sinful nature's thoughts still remain 30%, then the thoughts of Jesus are 70%. It still works a lot in me. If my thoughts are 10%, then the thoughts of Jesus are 90%. It means I only have 10% of carnal mind. What if my sinful nature's thoughts are 0%? It means the thoughts of Jesus are 100% in me. The Lord will entrust all the work to these kinds of people. They are obedient to the Lord and have no thoughts of themselves so they don't satisfy their desires for anything they do. The Lord gives them power and authority. They are true leaders and servants. The leaders have to demonstrate and exhibit God's governance. The leaders have to demonstrate and exhibit God's governance, miracles, signs, healings to their disciples. At the same time, they have to demonstrate God's attributes and characters, love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, faith, serving, prayers, comforting, encouragement and sharing in their lives. The leaders have to show these characteristics of Jesus to their disciples in their lives. Therefore, the disciples will see and follow. The leader is the one who serves. There are leaders in the Bible. Let us take a look. I also love the life of living together with disciples. I really want to live like that. I want to make an opportunity to live with them. 
so I would like to live with my brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ and share our lives. It is about revealing everything. It is to reveal everything to show how we live our lives. Only if we do that, wouldn't the brothers and sisters live the lives together? Then I will be able to learn their good points by looking at them. We should learn good things from each other because we are one body of Christ. Leaders in the Bible First, Moses was the teacher for Joshua, where Joshua was a disciple and a servant of Moses. Later Joshua became a leader of Israel. Moses had laid his hand on Joshua. Let's read Deuteronomy 34 verse 9. Now Joshua son of Nun was filled with the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands on him. So the Israelites listened to him and did what the Lord had commanded Moses. Amen. The Israelites listened to Joshua. It is because Joshua son of Nun was Moses' servant. Moses had to hand over the leader's post before he died. For there was no one to lead the two million people of Israel after he died. Moses asked, God, who should I lay my hands on? And the Lord told him it's Joshua. Joshua was a servant, but the Lord told him to let Joshua be the leader. Because the Lord said so, Moses had laid his hands on Joshua. And Joshua was filled with the spirit of wisdom. The spirit of Moses transferred to Joshua. So the Israelites listened to Joshua and did what the Lord had commanded Moses. It is written in Joshua chapter 1. After the death of Moses the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua son of Nun, Moses' aid. Moses my servant is dead. Now then, you and all these people, get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give to them, to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon, and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country, to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous, because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips, meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid, do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Like this, God promised and spoke to Joshua personally. After this, Moses died. And Joshua led the Israelites to cross the Jordan River to enter the land of Canaan to occupy the land. Joshua was already full of the spirit of wisdom and showed that the Lord was with him. So Joshua ordered the officers of the people in verse 10. And verse 16 says, Then they answered Joshua, Whatever you have commanded us we will do, and wherever you send us we will go. Just as we fully obeyed Moses, so we will obey you. Only may the Lord your God be with you, as he was with Moses. Whoever rebels against your word and does not obey it, whatever you may command them, will be put to death. Only be strong and courageous. Like this, Israelites followed Joshua. Moses had laid his hand on Joshua. It was God's command. And the Israelites listened to Joshua. Let's read Deuteronomy chapter 3. I read it this morning, and it was written like this in chapter 3 verse 21. At that time I commanded Joshua, You have seen with your own eyes all that the Lord your God has done to these two kings. The Lord will do the same to all the kingdoms over there where you are going. Do not be afraid of them, the Lord your God himself will fight for you. God had already thought of Joshua as the next leader. Moses had told him about this. He said, Be strong and courageous. Go and when you conquer the land of Canaan. The Lord will give you all the land just like he did to Og, king of Bashan and Sion king of the Amorites who reigned in Heshbon. 
you'll take the land just like we did, so be strong and courageous. And Moses asked in verse 25, Let me go over and see the good land beyond the Jordan, that fine hill country and Lebanon. Then, the Lord replied in verse 26, But because of you the Lord was angry with me and would not listen to me. That is enough, the Lord said. Do not speak to me any more about this matter. He was saying stop praying for this matter because you cannot go into the land. And he continued, go up to the top of Pisgah and look west and north and south and east. Look at the land with your own eyes, since you are not going to cross this Jordan. Instead of going there, God let Moses go up to the top of Pisgah and look west, north, south and east. And in verse 28, but commission Joshua and encourage and strengthen him. For he will lead this people across and will cause them to inherit the land that you will see. So here we can see Moses, a teacher and Joshua, a disciple and also a servant. These two were in relationship of teacher and disciple. In Deuteronomy 32 verse 44, Moses and Joshua spoke all the words of this song in the hearing of the people. They spoke together. It means Moses did it to make Joshua a leader. Also in Deuteronomy 33 verse 1, it mentioned about Moses, the man of God, who exhibited God's characters. Now, let's talk a little bit more about Moses, the teacher. Of course, Joshua was a really great servant. But I'll talk about Moses first. Moses was a very humble man. According to Exodus 32 verses 11 to 14, 30 to 35, Moses was an intercessor. Moses as an intercessor went forward to God by risking his own life when Israelites committed sins, asking God to forgive them. Moses said, Lord, if not, then blot me out of the book you have written. Because the people of Israel made and worshipped idols. While Moses prayed for forty days and went down the mountain with the two tablets of the testimony. Lord said, Moses, go down, your people have become corrupt. Hence, he went down and saw them drinking, getting up to indulge in revelry and worshipping the idol. Moses's brother, Aaron, had made the golden calf. People were worshipping the golden calf. The Lord said to Moses, Now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them. Then I will make you into a great nation. Can't God, who can make man out of stone, make a great nation? But Moses sought the favor of the Lord his God. He said, O Lord, why should your anger burn against your people, whom you brought out of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say, It was with evil intent that he brought them out, to kill them in the mountains, and to wipe them off the face of the earth? Lord, please turn off your fierce anger. If not, then blot me out of the book you have written. It means I'll go to hell instead of them. Moses risked his life to pray to the Lord to forgive them. After doing so, the Lord relented and did not bring the disaster. If it were me in the past, I would have said, Sure, please destroy them all and make me into a great nation. But now, I am different from my old self. I think I might have said like Moses. If it were my old self, who were greedy, I would have told God to destroy them all. However, Moses didn't say that way. He really wanted to go to the land with those people. So he prayed in front of God. And the Lord listened and replied. In Exodus 34 verses 28 to 35, Moses's face was radiant when he finished his prayers by fasting for forty days. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, his face was radiant, and they were afraid to come near him. So Moses put a veil over his face. But whenever he entered the Lord's presence to speak with him, he removed the veil until he came out. Then Moses would put the veil back over his face because the Israelites saw that his face was radiant. When God created Adam, he was in the middle of the light. Adam was crowned with glory and honor. Though Moses' face was radiant for a while, the people were afraid to come and see his face. In Numbers 12, 3, Moses was a very humble man, more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. One that did not have his flesh-oriented minds and own greed. 
Moses was obedient to the voice of God. Man of Obedient If you read about Moses in the Bible, you can see that Moses always did as the Lord said unto him in the mountains. And he always did as God commanded. That was the life of Moses. Moses was a person who sincerely obeyed. Moses' life was so beautiful. In Exodus 19, Moses exhibited his leadership in the presence of God. In chapter 19 of Exodus, the Lord came down to Mount Sinai. On the morning of the third day there was thunder and lightning, with a thick cloud over the mountain, and a very loud trumpet blast. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke, because the Lord descended on it in fire. He descended to the top of Mount Sinai and called Moses. All the Israelites heard it and they were trembled in fear. All of them heard the voice of God in person. The Lord came to them so that the people would hear him speaking with Moses and would put their trust in Moses to make him a leader. So he did it on purpose to make them be afraid of Moses. However, they trembled with fear and said to Moses, Speak to us yourself and we will listen. But do not have God speak to us or we will die. The Lord came and said with the pillar of fire and pillar of cloud. What kind of person was Moses? He was the prince of Egypt. He was the man who could be king of Egypt. However, because of the Israelites, he fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian. And there, he had been tending the flock for forty years. For forty years, he broke all his thoughts that he had. He could not even speak Egyptian properly. He was the prince, the prince of Egypt. He was a very successful man and could soon become a king. But he went to the desert of Midian and was trained to be a man of humble, didn't he? Self-denial of Moses is a little different from the situation of Joseph. Moses, who was a prince, completely lowered himself to be a servant, a shepherd. But Joseph was not a prince. The situation of Moses was different from that of Joseph being a slave and serve as a servant. The prince needed to deny himself even more. Like this, Moses was a man of humble. In fact, God moves according to his plan. He sets up his dispensation and commands according to it. He planned to give this land, the land of Canaan, to Abraham and to his descendants. But he could not give it then. Why? The sins of Amorites were not filled. God couldn't take the land by his pleasure even though he had made it, because the sins of Canaanites were not enough. He could only give the land to Abraham when the sins of Amorites were full. He said, In the fourth generation your descendants would come back here, the land of Canaan, for the sin of Amorites had not yet reached its full measure. Then, in the time of Jacob, who moved first? The Lord promised with Abraham first. He said that the descendants of Abraham would be strangers in a country not their own, and they would be enslaved and mistreated four hundred years. He made Joseph be taken to Egypt first and made him be a ruler of all the land of Egypt. After this, Joseph invited Jacob and all his relatives to come to him, in Egypt, seventy-five persons in all. And the time drew near for God to fulfill his promise to Abraham. It had been four hundred thirty years when he called Moses to lead the people to the land of Canaan. The Lord called Moses, this man, in the flames of a burning bush. He had seen the oppression of his people in Egypt and heard their groaning and came down to set them free. He promised Abraham that they would come out of Egypt with great possessions. As he said to Abraham, through ten miracles, the Egyptians gave them gold and silver and asked them to leave quickly. So they left Egypt to enter the land of Canaan. God continued to work in his plan. And eventually, through Joshua, they conquered and he distributed the land. He divided the land as an inheritance half of Manasseh, east of the Jordan, the Reubenites and the Gadites had received. He was also able to fulfill the duties of dividing the land among the nine tribes. And the other half of the Manasseh to the other side of the Jordan where now Jerusalem is. Actually, Moses trained them all. You know those people who went into Canaan and it was Moses who trained those armies. He trained them in the desert for forty years. 
and Joshua took these trained men into the land of Canaan for the conquest war. Like this, Moses showed his life to Joshua. God used Moses and Joshua. Then, what kind of person was Joshua? In fact, Joshua was the servant of Moses. He followed wherever Moses went and observed what Moses performed. He served Moses who was always obedient to the voice of God. Joshua listened faithfully and bravely to the command of Moses who loved and was afraid of God. If Moses ordered him to fight with Amalekites, he did as Moses said. Joshua observed all that Moses performed. When Moses was about to choose his successor, God told Moses to choose Joshua. Because he served as a servant and learned from the leader, Moses. Therefore, God chose Joshua. In our thought, we may wonder how a servant can become a leader or a king of a country. When God chooses and anoints his leader, God manifests his wisdom and knowledge through the anointed person. When did David have disciplines of kingship? When did Joseph have the classes for being a ruler? If a man loves God, loves people, has the heart of God and fear God, God will anoint him and give him wisdom. Then he can be a leader and will have no difficulties. The problem is whether he really loves God, obeys God thoroughly, and loves the people. Obedience is very important. If God anoints the leader, the wisdom and power of God will be revealed through him, so people should listen to him. How can the people not obey him when he manifests God's power and wisdom? Therefore, Joshua went into Canaan with the soldiers Moses had trained, and they drove all the natives out through the war. Moses had been trained to be meek for forty years in the desert of Midian. The training of humility and self-discipline. And for forty years he lived in the desert with the Israelites as a meek man. He trained for forty years about meekness and self-discipline, and the next forty years he lived in the desert with the people of Israel as a humble person. And he also trained the soldiers. It was Moses who really worked on the law. Moses did this to make Israelites live by the law. Like this, Moses and Joshua were the perfect duo. Let's take a look at the second person. The second is Paul and his disciple, Timothy. Paul was a teacher of Timothy. Timothy was Paul's disciple. In Acts chapter 16, when Paul went to Lystra, there was a disciple of Jesus called Timothy. Because Timothy was obedient and followed the Lord well, Paul wanted to take him along on the journey. And through the book of Timothy, we could see how much Paul loved and taught Timothy well. And Timothy followed Paul obediently and was an example of a good servant. You know, 1 and 2 Timothy tell us about many beautiful stories. And there's the story of Timothy being put in jail. Timothy, who served Paul well during their journey, was described by Paul as his son. Third, let's see the leadership of David. David was a man after God's own heart. He was anointed by Samuel. A man who was after God's own heart means a man who had the same mind as God. He thought just like God. David was a man who loved what God loved, hated what God hated, and rejoiced in God's delight. A man who was after God's own heart. Don't you want to be like him? Yes, I do. So I prayed after being baptized by the Holy Spirit. Lord, please let me be a person like David. I want to be like him who was after God's heart, who wanted to act according to God's will, who wanted to live in accordance with God's word, and who could only do what God had commanded without turning right or left. Lord, I want to be like this. I want to live like him. It was because I liked David very much. David was a man who tried not to kill even a person. He had been a fugitive for more than ten years. Saul, who was anointed by the Lord, tried to kill David. However, the Lord did not allow David to kill Saul. Since God forbid David from stretching hands to the anointed one. That means David could not even kill Saul who tried to kill him. After David cut off a corner of Saul's robe, he was conscience-stricken. He could not do that. 
He was the one who loved and embraced all the people. He didn't want to kill Abner. And he tried his best to save his people. After he became king of Judah, no matter what the relationship between Judah and Israel was, he tried to show goodwill and embrace all the people. He tried not to hurt even those who wanted to hurt him. He tried to embrace them. And after that, God took the life of Saul. He always cried out in the presence of God Father, asked and handed everything over to God. He was a man of obedience. He is a great example for me. In the case of describing all the kings of Israel in the Bible, this king was unlike David. Unlike David, he did not follow God righteously. It means the king was unlike David who had followed God with all his heart. For the sake of his servant David, the Lord was not willing to destroy Judah. He had promised to maintain a lamp for David and his descendants forever. That is how David followed the Lord. He was anointed by Samuel as king. He had been tested for so many years. He was a proven character. He was the man who lived the life of a fugitive to keep the word of God, wasn't he? He risked his own life to keep the word of not lifting a hand to destroy the Lord's anointed. He only could run away. So that David followed God with all his heart for his entire life. Let's read 1 Kings 14 verse 8. I tore the kingdom away from the house of David and gave it to you. But you have not been like my servant David, who kept my commands and followed me with all his heart, doing only what was right in my eyes. The Lord said to Jeroboam that David, his servant had done things like that. The Lord was pleased to say David was his servant. And he said, My servant David kept my commands and followed me with all his heart. He did only what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Then, let's read chapter 15 verse 5. For David had done what was right in the eyes of the Lord and had not failed to keep any of the Lord's commands all the days of his life. Except in the case of Uriah the Hittite. He had not failed to keep any of the Lord's commands and did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Therefore, I prayed, God, let me be like David. This is the leadership of David. He risked his life to keep the commands of God. And he loved his people and did not want to kill even a man. And he wanted to embrace all the people. Fourth, the leadership of Samuel, never stop praying for the people. He was an intercessor. We also want to sleep at night. However, the Lord makes us wake up and pray. If we do not pray, the Lord cannot work. That's why he wants us to be awake and pray, though others are asleep. Of course Samuel must have been tired and wanted to sleep. However, he needed to get up and pray for the people of that day, otherwise, the nation would be in trouble. From my point of view, the intercessor is like the heart of our body. Without the intercessors, the country will perish. The whole world will be ruined. The demons will eat and swallow them. It was the leadership of Samuel. Next, let's talk about the leadership of Joseph. About the leadership of Joseph in Genesis. His brother sold him to the Ishmaelites for twenty shekels of silver. Joseph, however, said to his brothers, he said, Do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here, because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. He told his brothers that God sent him first to save their lives. This is the leadership of Joseph. He was a man of forgiveness and godliness. He nourished not only his brothers but also their children. Joseph must be broad-minded to become prime minister of Egypt. He had to be able to embrace many people. Egypt was then a wealthier and more powerful country than the United States today. So he had to have a broad mind to govern the country. But look at Joseph when he was a 17-year-old boy who was a tattletale. He was a narrow-minded boy who told his father about his brothers. However, he served as a slave and a servant as he went through hardships and tribulations in the house of the captain of the guard and in prison. God trained Joseph how to serve. 
That was why he sent him ahead. God made Joseph a slave to serve. He could not serve in his father's house. Of course, he worked as a shepherd, but his father made a richly ornamented robe just for him. No wonder he could not serve, right? So, the Lord sent him to prison to train him as a servant. And the captain of the guard charged Joseph with officers in the prison, and he served them. He was a slave. He learned to serve in the lowest position among all the servants. In the prison, Joseph still had a little complaint. Because he asked the cupbearer to remember him and show him kindness to get him out of the prison. However, in God's eyes, Joseph's training period did not seem to be enough. God made the chief cupbearer forget Joseph. Hence, Joseph had to stay in the prison and serve. He gave up everything and surrendered himself to God. He only served and thanked God. By then, the Lord had passed the training. In the book of Psalms, the Lord sent a man before the people Joseph, sold as a slave and his feet were bruised with shackles and his neck was put in irons. Joseph's leadership is the leadership of service and so is David's leadership. David became the king and Joseph became the ruler. Both of them had the leadership of service, which was to serve as a servant. If Joseph did not learn that, how would he serve people after becoming ruler of Egypt? He would have been served like the kings of the world. But God's people in the Bible do not act like the kings of the world. To be an example of a servant, they showed leadership as a servant. Joseph was a man of trial. During a long time for you being trained, you might think, why should I be trained like this so much? It is because God wants to use you. That is either one of these. Since you do not surrender what God asked you to do, and that is why he would not give what you want until you give up. Secondly, if you are still being trained, though you gave up everything, it's because the Lord wants to make great use of you and lead you to bigger place. That's why you have to give up early and take it all down. Abandon all you thoughts and dreams of the sinful nature. Sixth, let's share about the leadership of Daniel. Daniel and his three friends ate bean soup for three years not to eat food that were given to idols. It means they drank soy milk for three years. Then you might think that they would suffer from diarrhea. But they did not. They said to the official, please test us for ten days, give us nothing but vegetables to eat. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food. They looked healthier and better nourished. God helped them. They risked their lives to keep the words of God, such as not to serve idols. The king set a statue and told them to bow. But Daniel and his friends did not do it. They risked their lives to obey God's command, do not serve idols. So they were thrown into the blazing furnace. But God protected them. The Lord said that, who would he save if he does not save people who give up their lives to obey God's word? Look at their leadership to follow the word of God. So is Daniel. Daniel only prayed to God. But he was wrongly accused and was put into lion's den. He was thrown into the lion's den to obey God's command of pray continually. But God covered the lion's mouth. He was alive. The lions followed him even in the lion's den. They did not bite him. How grateful! God saved him. That is the leadership of Daniel. In Daniel 5 verse 17, he didn't pay attention to rewards. He wasn't interested in money at all. The king said that, if you interpret this, I would give you money and rewards. But he said, you may keep your gifts for yourself and give your rewards to someone else. Nevertheless, I will read the writing for the king and tell him what it means. He had no interest in money. Daniel and his friends focused only on God and served him. And that leadership led Daniel to become the ruler. He was a ruler for several generations. What do you think Cyrus told Israel when he was touched by the Spirit of God? He told them to build a temple. How did Cyrus know it? 
from the first year until the year of Cyrus, Daniel was prime minister for a year. Then who told Cyrus about God? It would be Daniel. Daniel was the prime minister until the first year of Cyrus. It means that Daniel's influence was great. We have seen the leadership of serving. Daniel always repented before God for the iniquity of the Israelites. How about Nehemiah? Nehemiah was like Daniel. Nehemiah and Daniel, who repented and prayed for the sins of the people, prayed for the people as well. Prayer is a service. Pray for other people even though you want to rest. Jesus wanted to rest, but he always prayed for his disciples at night. He prayed for them not to fail in faith. He prayed to protect them from evil, keep going on the narrow path of faith, and to obey all the things that God had commanded. Daniel also prayed for the people like that. Moses, Samuel and Nehemiah were also intercessors. They were intercessors. How about Paul? How about Timothy? David was also a prayer who prayed every day. He always cried out to the Lord. Also, Joshua and Joseph. The leadership that we saw in the Bible is the leadership of serving. Jesus came to this land as an example of a servant for us, the new creation. We should take a leaf out of Jesus' book. Jesus is our only mentor, teacher, and example of serving. We will only follow him. Brothers and sisters, shouldn't we follow our Savior, Jesus Christ, as a great example of a servant and live by serving him? It's all for today. Thanks for watching.